regards to prototyping, one of the bigger themes that we see is often talk around the tools that we use, which of course I'll be addressed in some capacity tonight. But one of the themes that I thought was super important to be talking about was the process of when to be prototyping. And what's really unique about tonight is each of our panelists will each start with a 15 minute presentation of a specific case study. And each case study is different. It's a different take on how prototyping can be used within our process. So Sabrina's at BuzzFeed is talking about um, testing the demand of a product, testing the idea of product market fit within their, what they choose as far as products that they'll pursue to develop at BuzzFeed. Dave's is about a really important micro interaction at Canary that's core to the product. And Joris's is about high fidelity uh, design prototypes with really high fidelity capacity. So they come at from really three different angles, and I think it's really important as a as people who prototype to understand the breadth of how um, this aspect of our process prototype can be used. So without further ado. Okay, thanks Jonathan. Oh, flat. Um, by the way, I had custom typography in my keynote deck that didn't make the transition here, so please don't judge me for the way the slides look. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about how prototyping fits, prototyping and design sprints fit into the way that we validate product direction at BuzzFeed. So, I joined BuzzFeed in late 2013 as a designer working on our iOS app. Um, we also have an, an Android app. But I, I focused on uh, most of 2014 designing that. And then in 2015, we got really ambitious. And we actually launched four apps in the course of that year. And in doing so, we learned a lot of important lessons, like mainly that launching apps is a huge investment. Um, at a minimum, it takes about six months to ship one of these apps. But at the most, it could take over a year. And it's a huge resource suck. Like we have to, if a lot of times we have to hire new people just to like create content for these apps as well as code and design them. So we decided that we needed a smarter way to sort of validate when it was worth investing and pursuing one of these ideas. And for that, we sort of turned to Google Ventures design sprint process. So yeah, so uh, Google Ventures, um, they always a book about this earlier this year. Some of you might have read it. We've actually adapted our process to fit our specific needs. And the goal of running design sprints at BuzzFeed is to test out different prototypes in order to gather qualitative data on whether or not we should more formally pursue an idea and dedicate resources towards it. So this is the schedule of what a typical sprint week looks like at BuzzFeed. Um, Monday is pretty similar to Google. It's a bunch of learning, like looking at personas, competitive analysis, um, looking at our existing data in that given topic or that area. Um, Tuesday is a lot of diverging, low fidelity sketching, things like that. The, the part where it gets different is that Google recommends one day for prototyping, and we actually spend two days on it, and I'll go into the reasons for why that is. Um, but then Friday, we bring in actual users that match our personas to test out the different prototypes. Um, so the reason that we spend two days on prototyping, uh, mostly it's because our prototypes are now written in working code, so they're actually built in Swift. They're, there's no backend, but they are actual builds that work. Um, the reason for this is that I feel like over time, user expectations have sort of required higher fidelity of prototyping um, in order to make it feel more real. And the more real something feels, the better data that we're going to get back. So this has also been especially helpful for us when we've been prototyping video content. Um, for example, well, the first time we did a sprint, it was for the idea of a video app, and we tried using InVision, but InVision doesn't support video, so we were trying to get around that by making GIFs based on our videos. But because BuzzFeed is also known for GIFs, users were super confused, they didn't know what they were looking at. And we sort of learned that lesson that we needed to basically make this as real as possible like, by loading actual video content. Um, doing it in actual code also allows us to take advantage of the things that iOS can do for personalization and using real data. Like, you can know, have users take photos of themselves when they come in for a testing session and use that photo, the actual prototype, um, as their profile avatar. Uh, of course, this also allows engineers to play a pretty important role in our design sprints. So design sprint teams are usually composed of three designers, three engineers, and three people from our editorial content team. And then we split those people up into three teams, one in each um, role, and they each work on a different prototype. And so here's an example of a sprint prototype that actually ended up becoming a production app 
around the idea of an app to engage and adjust with BuzzFeed quizzes. Um, the prototype took two days to build, and the production went to five months. But I think the important thing is that we didn't have to wait five months to know whether or not this was an idea worth pursuing. Um, we didn't have any regrets later on. We knew that by the end of the week of the spring. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time kind of doing a deep dive into the last sprint we did, which was around the idea of creating an app dedicated just to the these lifestyle content. Um, lifestyle is like food, beauty, health, things like that. Um, the idea was inspired by Busby Challenges, uh, which is a type of post that we do that performs really well. They'll do things like a clean eating challenge at the beginning of the year where they post recipes, um, the ingredients that you need, step-by-step -step how to make stuff, and they'll post an update every day. There's a lot of community engagement around these posts, like people hashtagging what they've made on Instagram, things like that. And because one of the major metrics that we cared about on the app team was user retention, we sort of had this theory that challenges might be really good for that because there's sort of a built-in mechanism for retention, because you have to come back and sort of update your progress, things like that. Um, so we decided to run a sprint to sort of see if this idea had any weight and validate whether we should formally pursue it. So I'm going to go through the three prototypes that we tested. Um, the first one is called Lightfold. It was worked on by a food editor and a designer and developer. Um, we also test different entry points to apps, like App Store, Facebook, stuff like that. But we actually stopped doing that because we realized we weren't learning anything from that. Um, but yeah, so see there's like a checklist beforehand of what you have to do to commit to the challenge, which did not resonate well with people. It was a huge commitment. Um, this did resonate well, where they take a quiz to sort of generate a menu. This part was hard coded, but people thought it was real, which was great. They thought we actually like, created a custom menu for them. Um, and so you're trying to take advantage of things that we can do in an app that we can't do in a BuzzFeed post, like scheduling reminders to actually do a certain task, um, like sending push notifications. And, and if you did it, if you did the task trying to like reward people in small ways, so the second one is called Bucket List. Um, see the entry point here is for a Facebook post. And this one was worked on by a beauty editor and a designer and developer. Um, and you'll notice in a bit that this prototype has a lot more variety of content in it than the one before it, um, like hair, DIY, makeup. Um, and in a second, it'll, it'll go into the actual, um, the actual challenge itself. Um, so you'll see that there are photos from people who have taken the challenge for something we wanted to see if people responded to, sort of an ingredient list of things you would need to do it, and then step-by-step -step instruction, which is pretty typical for a BuzzFeed post. And then at the very end, we threw in a video tutorial because we just wanted to test people's reaction to that. And, see, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But the idea here was you would take a selfie of yourself, so like say you did it, and check it out the list. And, in this one, we explicitly didn't use the word challenge to try to make it feel more lightweight. And then the last thing is called do something. Um, we, we always try to throw in a connect with Facebook thing when we do these just to see how people react, if they're willing to actually do that stuff or not. Um, again, there's a bigger variety of content here, but we are explicitly using the word challenge. Um, and here, a challenge is composed of different sized tasks that take a different amount of time uh, so some of them might be like a one-minute physical task, um, so we put in a little timer there. Um, that goes really fast. And if you complete it, it sort of checks it off of the list. Well, but then there are also um, other tasks like just reading an article about health and fitness, which sort of take advantage of existing BuzzFeed content. And people actually responded really well to that, I guess, because it's instant gratification. They're like, oh, I can do this like it's from bed. I don't have to do push-ups. This is great. Um, and also, we can kind of take advantage of the fact that we can send reminders to people and prompt them to actually do things. Um, so some of the highlights, um, things that we learned from testing these with people were that people definitely preferred smaller accomplishments and smaller commitments. People did not like the word challenge because it does sound like a huge commitment. Um, they really enjoyed tasks that they could do on their phone. Um, the, the kind of sad thing about this is it was sort of in opposition to the goals of our editorial team, where a lot of lifestyle content is very aspirational, and um, BuzzFeed's lifestyle team, like, they really want to encourage people to actually do stuff, not just look at pretty pictures. And I think it's sometimes it's like writing a teenager, but people really wanted that instant gratification. 
Uh, the other major theme we saw was that everyone wanted to see a video and they wanted to see it right away. So on that second prototype, when they landed on that article screen, everyone just they would ask if there was a video and not read anything and just scroll until they found the video. And they would watch the whole video, which was kind of crazy. Um, and then the other thing was that participants preferred prototypes where it was obvious the app housed their product writing content, not just food or not just makeup or something like that. Um, we were also surprised to find that men responded really well to lifestyle content, just as traditionally that's not a demographic that content is targeting, but uh, a lot of our categories resonated really well with them. Um, and in the end, we decided to not actually pursue the idea of a standalone lifestyle app, uh, mainly because the reactions that we got, the sense of retention we got when we asked questions about how this would fit into the user's lifestyles, how often they would use it, how likely they were using it, just didn't give us a lot of confidence to enter a pretty crowded market where there's already a lot of challenge-based fitness apps and things like that. Um, we were also in the process of launching three other standalone apps, so we kind of wanted to see how they did first before committing more resources. Um, but also we learned that the BuzzFeed Life, like, which was the name of our lifestyle vertical, that just didn't really perform well as a brand. People had no idea what that meant. They didn't think that lifestyle content is different from any other type of BuzzFeed content. And a lot of them, when they were using the prototypes, they were like, well, I still want a way to access quizzes and lists and everything else that we're known for, which kind of um, suggests that our main BuzzFeed app would be a better candidate for these users than a standalone lifestyle. But even though we didn't choose to pursue that idea of that, I think it's important to note that it's not a waste of time. And the fact that we failed during the sprint saved us six months at the cost of one week. Um, also prevented us from having to staff a team full of at least two to four developers, product managers, designers, and editorial staff to curate and create content for those apps. So time is money. And we also learned things that um, we didn't <laughs> we learned things that we did not set out to learn. Um, so mostly the things about how popular video is and how well it resonates with people. So after the sprint, we launched Hotma, which is a mobile format video series focused on beauty and style tutorials, which has been performing really well. And as a company, we've shifted our strategy pretty heavily towards video. Like I actually work on video now instead of apps. Like that's how important it is. Um, and also the sprint started a conversation that led to the decommission of that brand that I mentioned before. So all that stuff content is just considered BuzzFeed content and just separation. Uh, yeah, so that's all that. Thanks everyone. Since uh, January 2019, about a year and a half, um, we've had some success, 
and stuff, lots of users. Um, and uh, basically what I'll, what I'll share aren't necessarily universal across the spectrum of how, how, how to work, um, but, but they are sort of little bits of information from my experiences and, and hopefully they can sort of inform your ways of working. Uh, you know, more often than not, I think as designers, we, we don't spend enough time thinking critically about all the stuff and some of the shit that we see online and videos and TED Talks and stuff. Uh, and, and we just kind of take things for what they are face value. And I think it's super important to, 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 to use those sort of bites of information and kind of bring, that, bring them back to form your own positions on things. Um, so that said, um, I'll be sharing a prototype that sort of lasts like three, four seconds. So it'll be over before you guys even realize sort of what's, what's actually happening. Um, but we'll take some time, go through it like pretty quickly, uh, start pretty slowly. Um, but, but, but this interaction is one of the most important interactions in our app. Um, it has to do with the watch live button that you see in the middle there. Uh, when we first launched uh, Canary back a year and a half ago, um, you know, basically like the same, there's some sort of status that we to be made. Um, but this is the number one interaction in our app. I mean, it's pretty highly encouraged uh, through the UI. Uh, and, and so that's what happens. People sort of love getting that assurance of being able to sort of just peek back home, make sure their dog's okay, make sure nothing is moving. I mean, half the time, I mean, yeah, I don't understand more exactly people do that, but uh, they just love that assurance that nothing's wrong. Um, especially this, the sort of users that we have who are concerned about security or something back at home. Um, so yeah, more often, uh, so, so you would tap on that and uh, you get a view right on into your home, live view uh, of what's happening. Uh, but when we, when we launched, more often than not, this is what you got. Um, and you got like about 15 seconds of this. Little spinner, 15 seconds, 15 seconds, waiting, waiting, nothing happened. Um, and then finally you get your view on home. Um, so this was like a we knew it was frustrating, our users knew it was frustrating, everybody was complaining. Um, before I come to the prototype, I just want to talk a little bit about sort of setting the context of, of how we prototype a canary. Um, really, uh, prototyping for us is like a totally, if necessary, uh, if required kind of exercise. Um, we don't actually prototype that much. As a, as a sort of new company, we're always working against the clock. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of runway or, or you know, those terms that, that uh, we just have a lot to prove. It's just sort of we're always in land graph mode, is what we call it at the office and stuff. And um, so we design what's good enough. We don't design what's perfect. Uh, we're, I mean, you know, we try and set a high uh, standard, a high bar standard for design, but uh, it's definitely not what we would consider perfect by any shadow of that. We'd probably spend a lot more time if we want to be perfect. Um, we design minimum viable products, really. Uh, and going from, from Frank Robinson's original scan that came up with the word minimum bottom product. Um, minimum bottom product is a unique product that maximizes return on risk. Essentially what he's saying is that you put in as little amount of effort to get as much as possible from whatever you know, product exercise you're doing. Um, you know, this is like a great sentiment, and, and this was a while back, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and this has been sort of appropriated by all the sort of like mean startup methods and uh, you know, the, the MBAs, everyone will give them a, 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 an acronym, they'll take it, so they're, they're good with MVP. Um, and, and really this sort of has to become a, a kind of, an MVP has become sort of synonymous with learning, data, uh, iteration, and sort of least effort. Um, and I think that in, in that sort of canon that exists in today, sort of lost this kind of entrepreneurial, that, that area, the entrepreneurial spirit of like taking risks. Um, and, and that sort of early life of a, of a company. Um, and I think the MVP can also be a small way towards customer satisfaction um, and building product momentum. That's really what we see the MVP as. It's, it's really about getting that product momentum. Um, it basically says that, that we're going to take this limited scope. We work in these very similar sprints. We work ours are two weeks. Um, and, we, and we limit the scope and time that we can spend on anything. Um, that's super critical for us. Um, you know, compare that against like an ambitious scope where you're taking two, three months to do anything. Um, and, and, and in our context, if you're you know, spending that much time, you're over designing, you're then over engineering, you're then over marketing and stuff, and by that time you're probably out of business if you're a young company like ours. Or you've, you know, you, you have to start laying 
maximize people on the set. Oh, wait, that's that. Um, just, you know, maximize for the small wins, I think uh, delivering value to our users is what these small, small wins mean for us. Um, makes them a little more patient, makes them a little more happy, makes them a little more loyal. Um, and and, and these MVPs help us get our ideas out into the world quickly, um, deliver value to the users, uh, and understand their reactions um, in, in a quick manner. Um, essentially, we see each of these MVPs as a prototype. I mean, that's really what they are. They're out in the world, we are them and quickly just iterate on them. Um, as a crowdfunding product, originally we had the Indiegogo thing, which you see over there. Um, it's in our DNA to basically allow our community to drive our products. So we've, we've never sort of like, shied away from putting something out there that's not perfect and sort of getting that feedback. Um, whether it's, we, we, there's uh, three product designers on the team, and, and all three of us read every single review that comes in on Amazon, on the app stores, and, and any feedback that our customer support team gives to us. We read all of it. So. That's how we're just constantly informing our stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, we haven't found, we're, we're doing things now, but in the past we hadn't found ways of doing like very explicit user testing, very explicit sort of like dedicated uh, exercises that some other bigger companies with more staff or more, more resources have the, the opportunity to do. Um, yeah, so this really helps us understand our users uh, in, in the best way and make decisions on their behalf, really we're really the product for them. Um, we could have them make those decisions with that, so we'd be trying to do that by carelessly through their feedback. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I mean, I think ideas really come easy. So, so this takes a ton of like focus and discipline. A lot of it is about what we don't do. I think we're all familiar with this quote from Tom Edison: "Everything that this is about doing anything. Uh, it's not about you. It's just like conventional way that this film. You know, everything just takes a lot of hard work uh, and focus." Um, so when do we when we actually prototype? Um, I think the few instances where we do prototype is when we really need to get complex into like an understanding of time, space, and objects. And this can be whether we're moving through flows or we're interacting with you know one specific uh, interface. Um, so the problem we back to back to this screen of loading death. Uh, so we had this block. We, we launched this blank video player that had no transition. No zoom took like way over 10 seconds to load, start playing the actual video, and we were having users constantly complaining that this thing sucked. Like, I mean, every day it's just one after the other. And you get this, this uh, you're, you're, you're on your own, um, and here users wanted to zoom, we were hearing feedback, we wanted to zoom. We knew that we were sort of like recklessly adding UI to this screen and that it wasn't scalable to the future work or we're thinking about new products and new feature sets that we need to add to the screen. Um, the transition was jarring. You could basically, you know, you could get disoriented. And uh, I don't know if you noticed on, on some of the earlier screens, but you, you have a view to your home, and then you have another view to your home, and there's like no transition between them. It's kind of pathetic. Um, so we have tons of information on the screen, on the edges and stuff, and I'm and, and really about showcasing the user's content from the center. Uh, we limited ourselves to where we could put stuff. Um, so these are all sort of the challenges that had come up over the course of, of six to nine months as the product had been added in a while. Um, and so over, over the, that same nine-month period, uh, nine month period uh, we, we, we continuously made, uh, continuously made infrastructural improvements. Our engineers were sort of slowly inching towards uh, a more improved latency. Um, but this is a costly effort. It's like sort of like a zero-sum game where where you just keep trying and trying and trying, and the closer and closer you get to like real time, the more and more outrageously expensive it gets to actually uh, narrow that mark, that uh, latency margin. Um, and so things from, we have opinions coming from across the company on how we can make the watch live experience better. We have the designers, shiny in, software engineers, we have hardware engineers, we have strategy people, operations, like you name it, they have an opinion on how we can improve watch life. Um, we talked about like moving more processing onto the actual device. We talked about pre-filming little tiny clips to sort of intersperse them into the video to, to sort of call it immediacy. Um, we had designed a, a loading state. Um, once we realized that, that all of this stuff was sort of around the same three to four second period, um, that's when we knew that there was this opportunity to, to, to completely rethink these three to four seconds. Uh, consider what we could communicate to the user and set that expectation for them. Um, so I'm going to run 
working as to this, this prototype. Uh, but before I do that, I, I, I mean, uh, we, we sort of knew that we needed a prototype. We had sort of a lot of moving parts here. We had the time, space, objects. Uh, we had the main view of the video player. We had this, this sort of blurred background that you see here. That's the first view into the user's home. And then that's like live thumbnail of their home. It's like dynamic to the user. And then we have the video of the watch live, which is the actual running video footage of their home. Um, we have to transition from this view to video player. Uh, we have to communicate that there's a loading state. Uh, we have to do that in a sort of vivid way. Uh, we have to communicate that, that you could zoom in and out of this thing. Um, and to organize the UI to maximize the information efficiency, uh, minimize the distractions from the user content, uh, and add scalability for the future versions. Uh, so this is going to play through. It's really quick. It's going to probably help it. That was the, the bulk of it. And then this is exploring how our, our logo watermark basically jumps around on the screen as you, as you interact with, with, uh, with the thing. And here the logo goes away because Pick is what we use for this for this uh, prototype from the support of their uh, So I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail. So I'm going to get to discover. So real quick, uh, what, what's going to happen here is that uh, I'm going to just slow it down so that we can look at the transitions, the UI movements, the UI physics. Uh, we're going to pay attention to the transition between the UI elements on this screen, the UI elements on the following screen, uh, the loading state, the transition from the blur view to the like, focus crystal clear view. Uh, there's a little live indicator that you'll see on the top right. Uh, we balance out to imply that there's zooming going on. Uh, the emergency options are slide in as a sort of reference that they're always there and you can use them. Uh, and then the canary watermark. Do my best to start on this thing. So once you tap it, you can see that the, the, the UI phase out, the, the uh, watch live UI phase in, and at least the pertinent information that's going to stay right here. Spin is super high, and it's going to on support videos. Um, then you see the crystal clear video comes in, as well as the live, live indicator on the top right there. Uh, and once that's ready, that bounces is in. So that's a little fast. And then you get the emergency options on the bottom, which is covered, and then the carry logo. Um, and then through the rest of the prototype, we're, we're sort of exploring how the logo disappears when you zoom and, and move around on the screen. Otherwise, you have this like watermark that's just bouncing around, moving everywhere with you. Uh, and then uh, we explore some of the sort of snap interactions. And basically, once the user starts pushing to zoom, you'll just see the next screen. where it snaps to fit nicely and not it, it sort of overlaid and underlaid the, the UI that's, that's sort of surrounding the screen. Um, so this is all. Uh, basically, we, what we did here was, was I mean, very simple. We managed to use this expectation for a few seconds and efficiently use that time to provide physical cues to the interface uh, interactions. I mean, uh, this is a little bit different. If you notice on the bottom here, we left our historic sort of emergency options, so we'll call them where you sound siren or you can make an emergency call to local police, fire, or uh, you know, EMS. Uh, but the rest of it is stands uh, as is. Um, and so uh, what, what, what actually happened once we launched, launched this is that we saw a dramatic decrease in feedback on watch life. Like we were getting these things like every day. Or that there was one person, at the very least, one review that said, watch the live latency sucks, it's so bad, it's so slow. And then uh, once we launched this, there wasn't really much engineering effort that happened between there, but we saw that the complaints come out like once a month, maybe, where we'll have like, a page that's in Japan and our servers are you know, miles away, telling us that watch the live sucks and the experience that the best are done. But for the most part, we saw dramatic decrease in the feedback we're getting. Um, the best part, though, was that once we started showing this to people in production, once it was live, uh, is that most of the people in the company thought that engineering had finally done it, that they had finally cracked like, the latency level. And there was like, no engineering work here. Um, as a designer, that like, felt like, wonderful for us. I, I think that's when, for, at least for myself, uh, the design feels right when it's sort of totally out of the way. Um, when the 
he did a sneaky notice, and these were like trained people that had been working on this product for, for years, uh, thought that it wasn't going to be designed to make that solve the problem. They didn't expect it, that it would be going to solve the design. Um, so, yeah, in closing, um, while every release is a prototype for us, uh, I think, you know, we prototype with a minimum viable artifact it needs to communicate the relationship of time, space, and objects. Um, and you know, as a designer, uh, as designers, it's our responsibility to look out for the user, right, or the, the empathetic ones. Um, but it's also our responsibility to communicate those uh, better experiences to our teams, get those things built. Um, and we build, they're nothing, right? They're just kind of like barren, whatever. Um, so as a tool of protest, we never design some imagination for real. Um, they help articulate the vision, they sell it through the organization, that's definitely what happened on this project. Um, both against the skeptics and for big visions that require far reaching changes across the entire platform. My name is Joris, I work so. Um, just very quickly. Um, so, to start off, for folks that are, let's start with the basics. Some people don't put a type at all, and then they may be wondering, how do I start with this? So they may be working for an organization where they have to convince other people to do this um, process where tools will come. Right? So how do you, what, do you what, what advice that might you give to people who are just starting off the process? I'll take this. All right, I can go. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess for me, I, mean, I think those, you can take away from the, just the, the short talk that we don't really have sort of like live and die by any particular process. Um, we sort of find the necessary tools to solve whichever problems we're trying to address. Um, and, and I think there isn't really, uh, we don't have a specific way like, oh, let's call in like, the prototype tool now. Uh, let's start using that. Um, it's really up to any of the designers at, at Canary uh, to just say, okay, yeah, we're going to do the prototype because there's X, Y, and Z that's happening. Um, we need to use that now because we, we can't communicate with you know, our ideas right now to build a team with printouts um, or with, with a, a keynote of, of a couple of series of, of slides or, or something. So um, I really think that it comes down to just saying, you know, identifying that there's a, the potential to, to show something that you can't show through some other forms of, of expression um, and then just doing it, uh, you know, even if it's sort of out of line or something within some other structure. Um, and, and you know, if you think it's successful, then there's probably a good shot that other people are going to think it's successful, and, and sort of trying to sell that through to the rest of the people on your team and, and how you can use that. Uh, if you don't think it's successful after you've tried it, then it's probably not a good idea to show it to anybody else. I mean, uh, maybe trusted colleagues, but um, you know, that's a way of just moving through through different options. But I mean, I think like the most important way of, of starting something is to just do it. It's you know, it's sort of like this little micro entrepreneurship within within the team and just like hustling and maybe it means you have to do it one night uh, or you'd rather be you know drinking or something but but you do it and then you show value to the rest of the team who might not have value for prototyping and then it sort of like clicks and, and sort of gets legs as it and then and then people start to get a sense for, for what value that can bring as a you know particular part of the process and you can sort of formalize it and everybody picks a tool and everybody gets a user sign in or whatever. What your experience with selling design sprints? Yeah. Um, so for me, um, I kind of got lucky with an opportunity where we decided to make a video out, and there was a small, sorry, there was a small team working on it. Um, they they kind of went away for three months and didn't show anyone anything they were working on. And when they came back, it was sort of a disaster, and senior leadership was really mad. Um, so I kind of took the opportunity to like go to a VP of product. And, was like, what if I told you there was a process for this where we could maybe get this on the right track? And I think at that point they were just open to anything. So we tried out the design sprint. It actually did not really solve the problem, but they did like the process. I think they liked that there's a lot of transparency in design sprints. Like we invited senior leadership to drop by at any point in the week, which they did. We also live streamed the user testing so anyone can call in and watch. So I think that was like people really enjoyed that and resonated with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, at Working Co, I feel like I'm pretty fortunate to be in an environment already where it's so core to our um, sort of to our process. But um, 
I think for, for a lot of other people working in agencies, it, it really comes down to what, uh, what they said is that um, as soon as you figure out a need for, you know, like just communicating an idea that you can't really do otherwise, um, there's really no waste in just trying to come up with any possible solution for showing it. And it doesn't have to be a high fidelity prototype, it can be something really simple, it can be a keynote, it can be just a couple of pieces of paper you stick together and you go through. But in my general experience so far has been, um, both with clients and also the other people that I work with, um, that as soon as I show them something that is in some level interactive or moving, or just a little bit more real, people get really excited about that and they get more excited about working on it. So um, there's hardly anything you can like do wrong with it. It just, uh, it just sort of heightens the excitement of the, of the whole project team. Cool. We're going to jump to a Q&A. So we may have covered this a little bit already, but just out of curiosity, in regards to like prototypes being a communication tool, it could be a device used to sell people internally, not just clients, engineers, managers, other designers. Any experiences to share on how prototyping could be used to facilitate those conversations? Um, I mean, in my experience, engineers really love prototypes. And they've actually been, it has to be one of the bigger applicants for us doing it more often because it just, it's so much faster than that back and forth where you're constantly describing an animation in words and you're like, make it a little smoother, make it a little mousier, like just doing it and showing them, like, they love that. I think it's the same for us. We have one engineer from working right here. I think he can testify that yeah. delivering a prototype is easier than just showing static comps and then trying to wrap up what it's about. And the same goes for clients. I mean, um, that's really somewhat like this is what a lot of our client presentations also look like, if, if, if it's even in a deck. So we really just show them um, the prototype and just walk them through it there in live. And then what's cool about that is that if you're in a meeting and you're talking about you know, how like a specific navigational item works or whatever, the client can be like, no, let's, let's go back, let's click on that again, let's like, really dissect that. And then you can really get to like the core of the problem really quickly by talking through a thing that moves. What about uh, designing at a real high fidelity capacity? You might all be interested in talking about this, but definitely, Joris, there could be something said that from a design perspective, there's certain nuances and transitions that a designer can see that maybe the common lay person just might not notice. So what do you, where do you stand on that? And how do you decide where you spend your time? Why not? Well, in our experience really, and that may be like, just because we're really into design, but um, the way we see it is it's, it's like, even if you start obsessing over these like tiny little details that maybe only you're gonna notice visually, we feel that it's definitely gonna manifest in the experience. And every product that has a lot of care put into it is gonna be noticeably better experience than a product that doesn't. And so just putting as much effort and time as we can into really fine tuning details and trying out stuff and you know that like kind of brute force design of just like trying out everything and, and until we land on a solution that, that really satisfies us, um, we feel like that in the end, even if it's not visible, it's definitely felt by the user having a pleasurable experience. Dave, your experience with micro interactions, um, has it, do you now see more in other apps within your own app? Do you look for opportunities to be creating some micro interactions now that this story, which is such a strong story within your organization, can be um, I mean, I definitely think that uh, those sorts of nuanced interactions were always sort of visible to at least the design team. Um, and probably some you know, even the engineering team and stuff where, where there's opportunities uh, to, to sort of really get into the details. Uh, but I think it, what it comes down to is where, where we can spend our time. Uh, and so, so that's always like a big sort of balance for us is, is you know, where, when do we get to the point where, where now it makes sense to do a prototype, uh, at least at like a high fidelity sort of micro interaction level. Uh, because, I mean, if we do sort of like a lot of like low-tech prototyping where we'll, you know, we'll print everything out and you can see one after the other or we put it into, you know, keynote and you can like 
tap. We're, we just we're working in Dropbox on our phones, and we can swipe through them. So it's like a again low fidelity kind of like prototyping. So we're getting that as much sort of we're bridging that gap as much as we can with the sort of audience that we're dealing with. Um, but I guess to some degree, being sort of all internal, right? We, we have we're learning that we don't have like clients. Maybe the farthest we get from a product person is like our you know our CEO or something, where it's like. You know, what, is, what, what does that mean? Like, and, and then we have to sort of like get into some more detailed work to try and communicate, you know, bridge the imagination gap. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how do you how do you test the uh, a six month lifestyle experience in such a short amount of time? How do you prove that case? Yeah, well, we, we put a lot of effort into testing the first time user experience because since we care about retention, we feel like that is the key to retention anyway. It's just like that first time use and if people come back again, that's a good sign. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not, um, I mean, if we were to actually pursue it, we do end up beta testing and like trying to test internally a lot to sort of test over a longer period of time. But for the sake of these sprints, we focus on that uh, first time experience. Um, just one or two more questions and then we'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, prototyping in code versus something that's global, where do you recommend or where do you advise people to choose one or the other? Um, whatever works and whatever you're comfortable with. Um, over the last year, I think I've, I've tried everything. I tried Quartz, I tried Framer, I tried um, whatever it's called, Principle. Um, envision whatever so um, it really depends on kind of what you're comfortable for like what what can fit the problem what fits your workflow and what sort of allows your mind to think the right way so for a while I had a really good time doing an origami because just like connecting these nodes felt very logical to me and then I had another phase where I just felt like approaching things from a code standpoint like in framer uh, just made me think about the problem in a different way and like came to a different solution so um, I think there's value in just like trying everything and seeing what feels natural and, and what gives the best result. Yeah, I mean, it, it also depends on sort of the intended medium of where you're going. You know, that a lot of people are big on doing web prototypes, even if they're static uh, for websites because they're sort of a more one-to-one -one relationship. It's much easier to hand off to engineers. The engineers love, love getting that because there's sort of, you know, sort of real big gap between what you're thinking and what needs to go. On. And then it's just their job to learn refactor and make it actual you know, real life code. Uh, you know, so, and, and I think different tools sort of offer them, they have their sort of restraints where, where you, you, know, you might want to use one tool for develop, you know, for, for imagining an experience on the web versus imagining a, a native experience on, that has Android limitations versus maybe iOS limitations and stuff. Um, so I think I mean it really comes down to like whatever gets the job done. Cool. What's uh, Favorite tools and tools that you have used that you'd like to? I've been using a lot of Framer recently, um, just because it worked out recently, and, and, and I've been trying to learn more um, in that in that sense. And in terms of what's still out, I'd, I'd love to try the new origami that Facebook is working on, but I'm not too hopeful that's going to happen. Yeah, I'm also uh, or Chris Composer is my personal preference. I think kind of like you mentioned, it's just a logical way to think about it. I also think you can do anything in it. Like I actually prototyped the thing for VR last week in course. There's like open source um, patches for that. Um, but I haven't tried principle and I'm kind of interested in trying that. Uh, I mean I guess for me it's probably at the moment uh, pretty biased again, I really don't like minimum viable product uh, prototype. <laughs> You know, like whatever gets me quickly is to that artifact that I can then communicate out to the rest of the team. Uh, so, so I, think, I mean, Pixit is one of the ones that I've been using because for me it's just so quick and so easy to just get in there and start making things move around um, in a fairly native way, uh, and it just works for for the way that I think about like maybe conditionals and if that type of stuff. Uh, that and then just like the sort of the basic. Like keynote, I mean, we use keynote all the time. Uh, we use you know print things out, and we start to see them putting in Dropbox. Uh, so they're not necessarily like the ones that are, are sort of in that like canon of like the best prototyping tools, but uh, again, they just get the job done. Uh, I've 
fooled around with some of the other ones, but uh, never enough to, to put it into everyday workflow or to, uh, I don't think we have the time to really spend on uh, some of that kind of fidelity. I guess that's the best thing. It's a just by we use Envision a lot, and we also have fully functional coded prototypes. I find from experience that, at least for our projects, because it all always really depends on your projects, or at least the one you, you showed, it's just it's such a high fidelity and nuance in the transition to really matter. But uh, I find that the, the working coded prototypes, the, the, the value for me when I'm doing research with a customer is when you can import the, their own data. It makes so much more of a difference to be able to use that versus something that's static where you, know, you have to maybe try to explain something. So a lot of it's, I guess, judgment. So, questions? Should we start from there? Yes, yeah, we'll start yeah, from the beginning. beginning. Yeah. Um, my question was for um, the working group project, the video app. Um, I was having a little bit more of a question about how you figured out what color to pick for the transition mm -hmm. in, in the last part of the project. You said that the Designed developers were figuring out how to create that, or did you guys already figure out? How did you pick which color? We, was one of the yeah, um, so that part of the thing I didn't personally work on, but as far as I can gather, what we did was that um, we um, sort of divided the, the video up into like a matrix, and then I think we um, picked at like 16 different spots in the video and then sort of average that out into like one value and then we tweaked sort of the, the hue and the saturation so that it would be like always like kind of like a fresh poppy color. But it was just sampling sampling colors from videos and then that breaking that down into like something of that. Yeah. Uh, yes. um, so obviously like stuff you can actually takes a fair amount of time. So how many static visual comps did you usually get in front of the client before you even start working with any one action? It, it totally depends on the project. Um, and it also depends on the designer, obviously. We have some people at Working Co that are more comfortable in prototyping tools and others that are less comfortable. So um, like I said, whatever like sort of gets the job done, like people just bring whatever they need to get their idea across. Um, I know some people, um, that, like myself, that within like the first couple days of, of um, generating ideas and in concepting, um, I just start playing around with actually seeing how it, how it feels and how it, how it moves. And then other people that sort of um, are way better in just like thinking about it in their head and just laying it out in like different steps and like a flow and then presenting that. Well, what about silence itself? Um, that I think that generally comes from statics, unless it's unless it's like ideas like changing the color of stuff. I think most of, of, of the actual visual design we do that statically. We rarely do that, for example, in code. And I mean, you have a fair amount of buy-in before you move into the, the prototypes, sort of right? Uh, um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes it's just really uh, in idea generation before the client has seen anything before any of like maybe like we always have one partner in the project for example before the partner has seen it sometimes we just like put together a prototype and bring that to the to the stand-up meeting and then be like hey look look at this okay. um for this high fidelity stuff usually right we we explored a bunch of different stuff statically and then we're like okay how does this move how does this behave cool. and since i have my real quick sabrina usually <laughs> how many uh users do you run um, your, your sessions, right? Yeah, we try to do 10. Just because like, that's the most you can really get in a day, basically. Okay. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, this question is for Sabrina. Um, so I'm actually reading that sprint, uh, the Google Digital Design uh, sprint book. I'm curious um, how you guys have got up and running internally. Like, did you hire in somebody for a short period who was an expert with this, or did you all just get the book and somebody took charge? Yeah, um, it was me taking charge, um, no expert. But I, I actually used to work at a startup that was um, funded by Google Ventures, so they ran the sprints there for us. So I'd been on the other side and was like, let me try running this. I mean, they had they have a lot of good documentation on how to run it. Um, and then because of that, I didn't actually design in the sprint because the facilitator should be sort of removed from that. Um, but yeah, basically, that's it. And, and related questions, just 
How many sprints do you kind of have to go through before people start getting, especially the facilitator starts getting comfortable? Yeah, I think for, for me it was like the third one, because uh, each time we learned something didn't really work and we could make a change. Uh, yeah, actually, also I didn't really answer to the first part of your question about just getting everyone together. I think that is actually one of the bigger challenges, is just getting um, getting people to basically give up designers and developers for a full week is very challenging internally, so there's a lot of logistical, sort of political stuff that has to happen to make that work. Do you guys run those like every where they no, no, no. Like it's like once a quarter, yeah. This question is for Doris. I noticed in all the prototypes, the video, the full screen video was a one to one aspect ratio. Did, was that a deliberate decision or is there like a landscape view that we're not seeing or something? No, that was that was actually also one of the, the very first uh, decisions that we made uh, that the time also bought in really well. And I think part of the what, what helped that was actually seeing that it worked. Like it, it got the idea from the video across. And I think it's also one of the few things that made it to the app. And that was definitely delivered. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I really like when um, OSPEED showed like the insights, um, but I was kind of curious for if you just talk a bit more um, for how you tested for those insights and how they came about, and if there was any conflicting information. Yeah, so you can just like what we learned from, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, so uh, definitely, yeah, I didn't really talk much about the actual sprint process, but um, actually there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of like sketching. Um, people, like, we sort of split up, have people do individual ideas, pin those ideas up. People sort of like vote on the, sorry, the main ideas that they, sorry, I'm so used to this. Um, they vote on the main ideas that we're gravitating towards, and, and then as a group, we actually storyboard three different ideas just based on. Um, we also go through an exercise just to make sure there are no conflicts where we're like, oh, there's like two popular ways of doing navigation. That means that those should be in separate prototypes, and we try to sort of balance things out. So we're testing like not just concepts, but navigational ideas, um, content. Like, yeah, it's definitely a lot of planning, but, and that all takes place in one day before we start building the prototype. It's all in the book. <laughs> yeah, in the book, yeah. Um, you guys all touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you each could share more insight on how you manage versions of your prototypes. Do you guys keep a master prototype? Are you like making branches? Uh, and how many people are touching these prototypes or leaving those? If you could share any insight on your workflow for that. I actually learned a great lesson preparing for this presentation because we use working prototypes, um, but we only spend two days on them. They actually um, are, do not stand the test of time. So um, it took a lot, like basically because iOS is updated since we built those working code prototypes, they don't open on the code anymore. I had to get a developer to basically install an old version of Xcode for an old simulator just to record those. So we definitely learned a lesson there about versioning and just like we should record everything and keep a permanent version of it. Uh, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, in Pixit, I guess it's not really, you're not doing too much code, but uh, this prototype is actually one we're actually, we've come back to it recently for uh, some of the new products that we're doing later this year. We have to update that stuff, and so uh, basically we just create like a, I mean, a, a, a design version of the tool, right? We just save as and kind of go off, and that becomes its own branch, and then we'll eventually probably won't merge that back in just because it's too much sort of like uh, upkeep for that and fix it, but uh, since they're not necessarily like coding files or anything that's easily maintainable, but we do sort of try and document after each uh, sort of like, okay, that's now done, like we're, we're gonna, in part, in part of the process of working with the engineering team, we'll document that stuff and get it in videos and uh, spec it out into tickets and stuff, and that kind of lives us that, that sort of stand the test of time. Thing, but, but again, we're working on something that's much sort of easier, I feel like, to work with than like a, a small iOS app in Xcode. Oh, sorry, when you say branch, does that mean you're actually using Git or a version of the control no, system? No, you're just like kind of like creating a, a branch that we then will do the like file name basically. Okay. Say, this went off that way, 
This is the master one. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll merge some of that stuff back in the last time. We can like explore like five different universes over there or something. Yeah, we don't really have a very documented process about this either, a working co. Um, so usually it, it sort of depends just when you feel like you're sort of departing in a different direction than, than what you've worked on previously. Maybe you got a bunch of feedback or whatever, then you just like create a new version and like try that out there. Um, most of the stuff we do is either nowadays is either framework or, or Yami and that's like self-contained files more or less. So we just like duplicate the file, work on a new file. Um, I don't think we use any kind of version control unless we work on, on HTML prototypes. And that happens less on the design side, more on the engineering side, I think. Um, and then usually uh, there's not too many people touching the same prototype. Um, usually, especially in the concepting phase, what happens is that we split up. We're working in teams around, let's say, around five people, um, which means uh, we have about three designers, uh, one partner overseeing the project, and then one product uh, manager. So um, the three designers usually everyone works on like an individual concept um, as you're exploring different things, and then everybody prototypes in their own concept. And then as you move towards, for example, user testing, if you have that as a milestone then you sort of look at what kind of prototypes you have to create and everybody sort of grabs one and owns that. And, and sometimes you take over stuff, but that's quite rare. Okay, so it all sounds very ad hoc still. Yeah, it's very, very random and very like, it's prototyping after all. You don't want to make it too um, strict. Uh, Sabrina, so I'm just wondering how much feedback you had gathered before you decided not to move forward with the uh, lifestyle app. How much feedback? Is that what you have? Yeah, like how many users? Yeah, I think it was 10 users, but uh, it wasn't. It was 10 total, because I remember you said 10 in one day. Was that yeah, yeah, just one day. So 10 total. Um, and the decision sort of like a senior leadership will go over the notes from user testing and basically make a decision based on that. The feedback that you guys get from the test, is it strictly qualitative or do you capture quantitative data as well? It, it is mostly positive. Like there are sometimes when we um, will like have like we'll have a big whiteboard with like a chart and we'll write like issues and if the issue comes up multiple times we'll like mark it. But I feel like ten is such a small sample size. I, I hesitate to call it quantitative in any way. So most of the designs we saw today were for like phone or app, but sometimes you're designing something for like desktop. So we also like prototype for different platforms together, or does it get like too messy? So we'll focus on one platform once and then. Um, for us, it, it, I mean, for us as an agency, usually we have a pretty defined scope of what we're working on. And um, usually for native projects, that's either iPhone or Apple, and we sort of approach that separately. Um, and then for web stuff, what we usually do is that we focus on sort of the main touch point of the experience. So um, it depends on kind of what the focus of, of the product is. If we do that mobile or desktop, um, I think mostly we still do desktop first and then spend like a bunch of time separately on getting the mobile experience <coughs> right. And so because that's sort of split up into different parts of the project, we just focus on one thing at a time. Uh, for us, I mean, I think I mean, most of our product is the mobile apps we don't really have. We don't have a web app that has our core feature set uh, or an iPad app uh, for that matter. Uh, but from when we did do our web app, which we used basically to manage our payment plan so that we could go over our apples, you know, 30% whatever fee. Uh, don't tell me I said that. Um, uh -huh. What we were doing was we, we started with prototyping all of it. Basically, we had like monthly plans, annual plans, and we had like four tiers, including the free one. And so this became like a sort of like checkout nightmare. Right? Like, 35 to 40 different flows, like when you cancel, when you upgrade, and you've been prorated on annual and all that For some reason, uh, at the time, we were, I don't know, all being really stupid and decided that it wouldn't be good to simplify this and like, just sort of make a lot of decisions on behalf of users and just start somewhere and, and we just made everything possible. And so, uh, one thing that was to our advantage was we prototyped and code in a kind of like very sort of rudimentary, sort of wireframe, basic, lo fi. Way and, and, and started with like a, a fully responsive like framework, right? And so that helped us. We were prototyping and going through all of these like uh, user, you know user flows, 
And, uh, and, and basically, by having it responsive, we, we were able to just like, while looking at wireframes, be able to identify points where, where maybe the experience of downgrading, you know, in the middle of an annual subscription just wasn't very good on, on a mobile, mobile phone versus on, on a sort of on a wider screen. Or so we started to kind of identify these things. And again, low fi prototype, but uh, it still helped to be sort of true to the, the you know, the, I guess the medium that we were going to eventually be in. And have designers that could at least hack, hack their way through like a, uh, a fully responsive you know, UX prototype. Uh, so, you said that um, you said that it took you about three design sprints um, to become comfortable with facilitating. What did you learn in those first three that you changed? Um, I know you mentioned earlier about using video, but users need to see that, otherwise, they're confused. Yes. Other things did you want to change? Yeah, um, yeah, the two-day thing was definitely a big change. The other change was the first time we didn't have any representatives from our editorial team. And what we realized is when we do these, we're also testing content ideas, not just design. So involving them was important. Um, obviously, like, obviously, also did not involve engineers in the first one. Um, also, there were just some exercises that Google proposes that just didn't resonate with people for whatever reason. They felt like it was a waste of time. I actually sent a survey out every time after we do one to sort of test people's engagement on different exercises. And so we just basically cut things out, which gave, gave us more time for prototyping. Is there a particular exercise that works really well? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> there's a thing called Crazy Aids. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. People either love it or hate it, where you have five minutes and you did come up with eight unique ideas and you do it twice. So you have 16 ideas. People, yeah, it's like either you're into it or you're like, this is so stressful. Um, <laughs> so that, that's like one of the controversial ones, but I really like it. The other thing is like the sticker voting thing, where when everyone pins their ideas up, um, you sort of have like, uh, everyone gets like three stickers, um, and basically you put them up on the ones that you like and you don't say anything. It's like a silent critique, which people, I think people like that because there's a clear artifact after the fact of what people like uh, gravitated towards. Um, this is also for Sabrina. Sorry if you talked about this earlier, I came in late. But I was curious for the Google Design Sprint um, whether you've noticed if there are scopes that are too large or too small from a problem perspective in tackling. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we do spend a lot of preparation time trying to make the scope right for a week. Like for the life app example I showed, at first they were like, life app, like could be anything. And then we narrowed it to this idea about challenges because that just felt like a much more concrete idea where we weren't having to com like create three completely different apps. So this is something that you can figure out Monday as a team? Like how this uh, we actually figured it out beforehand, like myself and uh, sort of like our product leadership. So there is a lot of like prep work just to keep the team within a certain scope during the week. This will be our last question. I'm honored. Uh, are there any thoughts on one, obviously, the granularity of the prototypes and the, how, how high fidelity it is impacts iteration speed. So how do you manage fluidly switching between different fidelity prototypes and iteration speed, as well as, if, in certain circumstances, reporting back those results to clients as well as stakeholders? Yeah. For, for instance, I imagine that if you give a really high fidelity prototype, Oftentimes, the client or the stakeholder will be primed to get in that level of fidelity in the future, but maybe you need to take a step back. So I'm curious as to the interplay between how do we go, go above this and understand when we need to use each type of prototype? I think, I think a big part of it comes down to you know, just having like very clear communication with the client. I think we're very open in our process and the way that we really show how we work from the very start. So they see within a couple of days, we have our first check-in, they see very rough designs, and they see whatever we're thinking about. And then when it comes to creating these prototypes, um, oftentimes we create them to work towards milestones. For example, to work towards user testing or whatever. We just try and, and, and make it very clear, talk to the client, what is, sort of what is the desired goal of, of creating the prototype? What is it, what we want to see? What do we want to test? What do we want to achieve with this? And then we work, you know, getting something that is as good as possible for that desired goal. And we really try to, to, to spend as much time as possible um, creating something towards that goal um, as we can. And then as it goes into iterations, um, sometimes I kind of bite you um, because like you spend a lot of time making something that is like 1,500 lines of code in Framer and then you have to change the structure and then you're 
doing it late night, but usually, usually just spending that much effort in planning things out then rewards you in the end by um, having you create something that is very fit for what you want to achieve. Does that sort of answer the question? I hope so. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys feel about? It's not a client relationship, that's right? That's <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, for us, it's just really, it's more independent sort of whether or not we want to make a prototype. And usually we're not, uh, I mean, we go through iterations of the prototype, but it's not like there's, there's not like, the, the, the end goal is, is either that sell through or getting to a point where we, if it's already conceptually sold through, getting to a point where it's uh, high fidelity enough that we can work with the engineers and we have like timing on animations and interactions and uh, all that sort of that's yeah, kind of the same for us. Like, uh, we, we're pretty transparent about our process, and all designers sort of practice the same one where they'll try to nail down application or like information architecture and low fidelity first, and people expect that before moving into high fidelity. So hopefully we're not going backwards on the same project. I mean, one other time that, that we prototype a lot is actually for pitches, because we feel like that gives us a huge advantage over other agencies that just come with a deck we just come with like a really prepared pitch. So like recently we pitched a, a big Apple TV app um, where I worked on a pitch and then Rafa was here and worked on it as well. And uh, whereas I think every other, um, every other agency just came in with just showing like static stuff and like having these like presentations with like very lots of buzzwords and what they want to achieve and everything. All we did is we, we essentially wrote in with three or four prototypes hooked up a computer and gave the executive an Apple TV remote and let him play with different ideas for his app and that totally killed it and we won the project for that. So that was another case where we, at the beginning of the pitch, we really talked about, right, what is it we want to achieve, right? We want to give the client sort of an insight in our pro process on the one hand and show them how we work really and then also show them um, really what the different ways, what the different directions are we can go with sort of what we got from them. And then building these prototypes really, um, we just try to meet that goal. And that sort of defined the level of fidelity and the level of effort and the level of sort of like what these prototypes allowed you to do.